Welcome to the complete guide to the Fetch API. In this lesson, we will look at the API details and give you practical code snippets that interact with various forms of HTTP endpoints. Towards the end, we will look at how we can use Fetch to create domain-specific functions for a REST API. If you are new here, subscribe for more content like this. And with that, let's go. Here we have an example HTTP GET endpoint that returns some simple text content that we will access using Fetch. We have a simple browser app running, so if I log something in the code, you will be able to see it in the console on the right. Now the browser Fetch API consists of a single function called Fetch. The first argument to Fetch is the URL resource that you want to access. The Fetch function returns a promise to an HTTP response object. So if we want to read the response object, we need to do that by using then on the promise. For now, let's log out the response to the console. A lot of the Fetch API is promise based. When working with promises in JavaScript, it is always easier to write code with async await so you don't end up with a then chain of doom. We move the Fetch call into an async function and then invoke this async function to kick things off. Now, because the call is in an async function, we can use await to read the resolved value of the promise and we log out the response to the console. Functionally, this is the same as the code we saw before, but much neater thanks to async await. Now, the next thing to discuss with fetch is how to read the body of the response. There are a few methods to do this depending upon how you want to pass the body, but since this endpoint is returning text content, we use the text method to read the response as a text string. Once more, this function returns a promise so we use a way to read the resolve value and log that out to the console. Most of your interactions with fetch in the real world will involve JSON content. Here we have an API endpoint that returns JSON content that we will access using fetch. We jump back to our code and use the JSON endpoint. Now we can still read the response as a string using the text method, but if you wanted to read properties, like the message over here, we would need to pass the string to a JavaScript object using json.parse. Now for our convenience, fetch provides a JSON method which returns the promise to the parse JSON object, so we don't have to do that. Now if we log it to the console, you can see that it is the JavaScript object. That's it for reading JSON responses. Now let's look at how we can send JSON requests. Here we have a post endpoint that accepts JSON as input. Things of note here are the HTTP method, which is post, the header called content type with the value application slash JSON, and the JSON body, which is sent as the request. This endpoint also returns a response that matches the request. Now let's look at how we can make this post request with a JSON payload using fetch. First up, we provide the endpoint URL. Fetch takes a second optional argument that we haven't used till now since the default behavior is fine for our GET requests. This second argument can be used to specify all the three things that we need to change. We set the method to POST, we add the header called content type with the value application slash JSON, and then finally we add the JSON body. JSON is actually a string format, so we have to take our JavaScript object and convert it to a string using the built-in JavaScript json.stringify function. As for reading the JSON response, we're already using the JSON method and logging out the parse object to the console. And you can see that it works as expected. Now, if you need it, you can make put, patch, or delete requests as well by changing the method string. Now let's look at a full RESTful API and see how we can encapsulate it with fetch. First up, we have a GET endpoint that returns a list of to-dos. Next, a POST at the same endpoint results in a new to-do and the server returns an ID for it. We can use this ID in the GET to fetch that single to-do item. We can also do a PUT at the URL with the ID to update the to-do item. And if you fetch it again, you can see that it's updated. And finally, we can delete the item by using the delete HTTP method. And now if we try to get it, the server responds with the 404 not found. 
Now let's use fetch to carry out all of these operations in a nice JavaScript API. With any collection of APIs, it's always a good idea to keep a variable for the base URL. Now our to-dos have a common structure, so we'll define that with the TypeScript type. First up is the utility function to return all the to-dos from the server. Fetch makes this extremely easy, as all we need to do is to make a GET request at the base URL and then return the parse JSON. The next utility we need is one to add a new to-do. For this we make a POST request to the base URL and add a JSON payload containing the name for the to-do. The server returns the ID as a JSON payload which we can access with response.json. Next up is the function to get an individual to-do. We make the GET request to the base URL with a given ID. We can check if the response code is in the 200 range by using response.oak provided by fetch. If the response is OK, we return the JSON body of the response. Otherwise, we return a null to indicate that the ID was not found on the server. Now let's look at a utility to update the name of a to-do. Since our server supports upserts, that is if the ID is not found, it does an insert, so we don't need to worry about the ID being invalid like we needed for the get function. We simply make the put request at the ID provided, passing in the new name as a part of the body. The final utility we need is to delete a to-do item. We use fetch to make a delete request at the ID provided and use response.ok to determine if the delete succeeded. And that's the end of the to-do utilities using fetch. Let's write some code to play around with to-dos to show how easy it is to work with these utilities. First up, we get all the to-dos from the server. We can log out the result by await and wrapping it up in a console.log. If you run this code, you can see that the server is returning the same four to-dos we saw previously when playing around with the API. Next, let's go ahead and create a to-do. Our add function returns an object containing the ID of the added to-do and we can use this ID in the get to do utility function and log it out to the console. Once this code executes, you can see that the fetch to do name matches what we sent in the add request. Next, we can update the name for a given to do item and if we fetch it after the update, you can see that it gets updated successfully. Finally, we can remove a to do item by a given ID. If you try to fetch a removed item, the server responds with a 404 and our utility maps it to a null. Once more, here is the code for a get to do utility function where we map any non OK responses to null. This brings us to the final thing worth discussing about fetch. Fetch only gives an error if there is a network level issue in making the API call. As long as the server gives a response, fetch succeeds and you can use the response object to add any special logic that makes sense for your use case. So if you make a call at some invalid URL, for which the server still responds with something like 404, the fetch call will still be successful. However, if we try to make a call to some URL that fetch cannot make a network connection to, fetch will reject the promise, which is the same as a throw in async await, and we can inspect the error object to see why the fetch call was unsuccessful. And that's all you need to start using Fetch for your application development journey. Smash that like button and subscribe for more content like this. And I will see you in the next one.